From the second a crime is committed, traces of the crime are left in the environment. The location where a crime took place can be full of physical evidence, which can link the crime to the criminal and ultimately assist the police in their investigation. This location is known as the crime scene. Crime scenes can be anywhere, indoors, outdoors, at business premises, domestic dwellings or vehicles, and no two are ever the same. Columbine by Dave Cullen. This book was released April 6th of 2009. It was re-released in 2010 with an afterword and again like the copy you see here in my possession in 2016 with a new epilogue in addition to a timeline of before, appendices, acknowledgements, notes, a bibliography, an index, a reading group guide, a teacher's guide, and to include the about author and about publisher pages, this book is comprised of 477 pages. Of that, only 358 pages are our actual story, broken down into five parts and then into 53 respective chapters. Our genre, of course, is true crime. However, just like in any genre, there are subgenres. The subgenre here is considered nonfiction contemporary American history. Weird. I know. Our publisher is 12 and that is a derivative of Hatchet Book Group. When we think of the word Columbine, it's hard to not go back in time and think of where you were, perhaps even what you were doing. For me, that moment is crystal clear. It was as if it was yesterday. I was 17 years old sitting in my journalism classroom and TV 101 was on in the background. Columbine was breaking news. I didn't realize it then, but Columbine would at that moment forever be a part of who I was. I don't know looking back if it was so much that I was the age of these children, if I could somehow better identified because I was in high school or the irony of the fact that I was sitting inside a classroom of respective journalism students and this story really changed the face of media, news outlets and how the information is not only received but dispersed. The date was April 20th, 1999. Columbine at that moment would be considered the worst school shooting in American history. That until April 16th of 2007, when a gunman opened fire on the Virginia Tech campus in Blocksburg, Virginia. Columbine, however, was not a school shooting. It was a failed school bombing. Yeah, I learned that from this book. It's strange because a lot of what I did for research then is not like the research that you and I can do today. Keep in mind, this was 1999. Yes, the internet existed, but smartphones weren't even invented yet. So the fact now that you can hear something in passing or see something on the news and you can immediately turn to your smartphone and all of this information is readily available at your fingertips. That's not how the internet was derived back in 1999. Google search engines were very modest. Now, if you put in the term Columbine, you can get everything from the basement tapes to the diary entries to things that were supposed to have been destroyed in evidence and never to be seen again. All of this material is readily available. For me, as a 17 year old girl wanting to know who did this and the human question, why? I had to wait years to get those answers. Dave Cullen was one of the first reporters on the scene that day. He then took the better part of a decade to gather the facts. I have to give Dave Cullen credit for his bravery in journalism. This book is laced with thorough journalistic integrity, which I feel the late 90s 
really solidified for media as a whole. Journalism changed the face of journalism, how we interpret media because of this thing called the internet. It became a race to the finish. Whoever could be the first, the first to get the interview, the first to do the on-camera interview, the first to get the words on paper, the first to put it in their magazine or to put it online, just to make this information readily available. Journalistic integrity suffered greatly. And this isn't just for small time journalists. This goes for the top creme de la creme. And that you'll see many moons later with journalists such as Brian Williams. People will at all costs say what needs to be said or skew the truth so they can be the first media outlet to say, you saw it here first. And that really is what gave me a sour feeling about journalism and media. I was certain at 17 that in some way, shape or form, media was going to be in my foreseeable future, whether it was radio or television production, whether it was journalism writing, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. After the Columbine tragedy and all of this information coming out, I wanted to be one of those reporters. I did an extensive article on it in our high school newspaper. I did a spot on it for TV 101 in our high school on that platform because I was a part of that organization as well. And I, I just got this insatiable thirst to get the truth out there. Lo and behold, the entire time I'm being lied to. I have to give Dave Cullen credit because his bravery and research is well articulated in this book. He goes above and beyond to not only demystify or debunk all of these myths surrounding this tragedy, but he makes certain that every facet of this tragedy is discussed and covered. Hats off to you, Dave Cullen, because this book is amazing. Now, before we get into the actual meat and potatoes of the book, I think it's important to give you the breakdown by parts. So that way it's a little bit easier to ingest all of this information because of the amount of material that is discussed in this book. It's, it's important to kind of take it layer by layer. Now, I'm not here to overwhelm you with information, but I will give you a little bit in each part. So it's important to point out before we even break down the parts of this book, the importance of reading our author's note. And the reason I stress the importance of this is because if you merely just jump into chapter one, you're going to find yourself very quickly asking yourself, how would he know that? Where did he get that information from? How could he possibly know that? So you're gonna find yourself asking a lot of unnecessary questions. So save yourself the trouble and read the author's note because here Dave Colin goes through his writing process where he derived the information, why he wrote in the certain way that he wrote and something that is so profound and so important and why he had my immediate trust before the story even started. Something I had always wondered, because I had picked up this book in bookstores before and put it down, but there was something that bothered me, and that was the lack of pictures. How can a true crime book be created, be considered to be one of the most tragic events, if not the most tragic event in American school shooting history, and have no pictures? I didn't realize that my brain was articulating what I had been trained over and over again. And that is the media is doing a very good job of painting this picture that you are only given a portion of what they want you to see. So you get a constant feed of the same pictures and the same videos over and over and over again from every media news outlet. Everybody shares the same imagery. And our author perfectly explains this in the addendum to the revised 2010 edition by saying he purposely omitted pictures being placed in this book because a picture only captures an instant, a moment, a moment in time of that person. It does not give you the full understanding or the full picture, if you will, of that individual. Oh my God, how important that is and how important it is that you understand that, especially 
moving forward in any true crime. Constantly you will see, and this goes back to smartphones and the, the digital age that we're in. Everybody now possesses a smartphone. So now everybody thinks that they are a camera person when they are out and about. The need to pull out your phone and videotape events as they are unfolding or as they are happening and then go home and upload them or you don't even have to go home anymore. You can just upload them from your smartphone to any social media platform and you're only providing a portion of that. Therefore, you're only painting a small picture. We don't know the whole story. And it's usually weeks, if not months, after the fact that we're getting the full story. Now people are starting to get smarter and say, hold on, I'm not buying this. There's got to be a reason why this happened. Don't get me wrong, once again, this doesn't happen in every case. Sometimes that 30 seconds or that 60 seconds does explain you know, a good portion of what happened. However, there are two sides to every story, just like there are two sides to every character. So jumping into part one, which is titled Female Down, this is comprised of chapters one to 19, pages one to 98. And here we get an introduction of everybody and I I segue that from what I was just talking about because I physically got sick to my stomach reading about our murderers. Dylan Klebold, 17, and Eric Harris, 18. Again, keep in mind, when I went into this book, I was hoping to get questions answered of assumptions that the media created for me, which were these boys were bullied, they were part of this stereotypical assumption that society had labeled them part of the TCM or trench coat mafia. It was because of the video games they chose to play and the music they chose to listen to. If I was judged at that same age, which mind you, I was at that time, I would have fit in perfectly with the assumption of Dylan and Eric on the outside. And, and I say that because we'll find out much later that there was a lot more layers to these two boys. I listened to Marilyn Manson. I played violent video games. It is a mindset. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is or what events happen to you in life or who you have that surrounds you. It's in here. If you already have it embedded within you that you are going to do something, that you have a thought process and you have the sick mind that Eric Harris had, you're going to see it through. He needed a weak mind like Dylan Klebold to see his event through. He couldn't do it by himself. On the flip side, Dylan couldn't see through his suicide mission without someone like Eric. So it was a murder-suicide mission that these boys were on. With chapter one, we not only get an insight to our killers, but we also get a perspective of the principal, Frank DeAngelis, and many of the other victims that you're going to see throughout the story that will unfold to bigger proportions, such as Cassie Bernal. If you're stepping into this story with the intent of the 20 minutes, because that's all it took for Eric and Dylan to consume 13 lives, and injure 24 before turning the guns on themselves, then chapters 11 through 19 will paint a very vivid image by image picture for you, helping you to understand that 20 minutes. Yes, folks, it started at 11.18, the first shot happened 11.19, and it was over by 11.39. 20 minutes. In 20 minutes, it all fell apart. This first part will also help to understand all the visual imagery that the media put on this, such as the pictures from the library, the span of time that it took to unveil, and so on and so forth. In part two, titled After and Before, chapters 20 to 30, pages 101 to 170, it is literally as it sounds. It is a chapter of before the tragedy and then after. However, unlike some books that I've read in the past that do a really shoddy job of going between past and present, this author does it flawlessly. It helps to pick apart the story and take those pieces and kind of build this story in your mind. So it does a really good job of helping you to put it all together. 
starting off part two, chapter 20. The chapter is called Vacant. It is gut-wrenching, it is heartbreaking, and it will wreck you. If you are in any way, shape, or form vested in this story as I was, you get a personal account of some of the victims and it will destroy you from the inside out. I wept. Danny laid in the snow for 28 hours. That killed me. That wasn't the only thing that killed me. I just, I never heard that humanistic side to any of these victims. You never really heard from the parents. All you got was their angry outcries and the blaming the Harris family and the Klebolds and, and there was just so much anger and aggression but you never got the sadness. You never got to hear the parents and that crushed me. Chapter 28 is so important in part two. It is called Media Crime, and this is really the debunking of all of the things that I was just talking about, the, the video imagery and those pictures paint continuously, and that is the trench coats, the goth the, being the social outcast, Marilyn Manson, and being Nazi sympathizers, Christian haters, all of that is discussed and so important to understanding. So part two is pivotal to getting inside the mind of the killers. In part three, titled The Downward Spiral, chapters 31 to 39, pages 173 to 236, it is very faith-based. It surrounds the martyrdom that surrounds the Columbine tragedy. Two names that you will hear almost synonymous with martyr and Columbine are that of Cassie Bernal and Rachel Scott. Cassie kind of overshadowed Rachel's story and that's actually covered in this book very well. Cassie's mom, Misty, published her book just shortly after the tragedy. I was 18 when I read it, so it was around, I guess, 2000 that the book was published and that book is called She Said Yes and it basically um, is an ev it's, it's basically a small biography of Cassie in her short life. I believe she was 16 or 17 when she perished in the tragedy. There was a book that was released in 2001 called Rachel's Tears, and that is a story based on journal entries of that of Rachel Scott. There was a lot of controversy surrounding these two books when they came out and this book, I, I will let it do the talking and I will talk about those books in a discussion in April when I cover this tragedy further. But I really appreciated what Dave Cullen said about both of these young women and the truth behind their stories. In part four, titled Take Back the School, this is comprised of chapters 40 through 47, pages 239 to 302. This, this part is really important in understanding the mindset that was both Eric and Dylan. Again, going back to how the media chose to portray them, it is very easy to assume that all of these factors, the music, the clothing, the being social outcasts, which all of that is just, all of that is expressed, discussed, laid out on the table and debunked. But when labeling someone as a psychopath which eric harris was ultimately titled as it is very important to understand where that stems from where it started and his insatiable need to find someone like him or someone weak-minded enough to see this through he could not have done this on his own so you get a genuine understanding of the word psychopath its comparison to a sociopath where that comes from understanding abnormal or violent social behaviors, and a further explanation on something that was started to be explained in part three, which is the juvenile diversion program that both Dylan and Eric conned their way into. Yes, I said conned, because these two could lie their asses off at the entire world and everyone would believe them because they were that good at lying. In part four, you also see Columbine start to regroup and rebuild 
um, the healing process begins and how students fight back at the media you finally get the sense of the attack that the students had on the media that portion is very important because that is rarely discussed out in the open because of course the media does not want to be seen in a negative light they need to be called out on the behavior they need to be called out on what they did and the way they manipulated the story and the minds of not only young people but everyone that truly had misconceptions about this tragedy there's also a big discussion on guns where they came from and i love that it's such a small chapter because he just gets into the exact who what where when and why this is how it happened now let's let's really look at the problem and that is eric and dylan and this chapter also goes into the lawsuits now the lawsuit portion of this for me was very reminiscent of the victims compensation fund of 9 11. how do you really put a price tag on a head so essentially it gives you a breakdown of all the money that was collected during this tragedy from various avenues and how it was divvied up amongst the deceiving and the surviving victims Keep in mind, there are 13 deceiving and 24 victims. In my personal opinion, you take the entire pot and you divide it evenly among the masses. That money is not going to bring back the dead and that money is going to help the living pay medical costs. But much like the victim's compensation fund, there was a misappropriation of funds and more money went to the deceased in this case than to the surviving and there was a lot of ill will. And I think that still plays heavy today. Lastly, you have part five called Judgment Day, and that is the smallest part in the book, broken down between chapters 48 and 53, pages 305 to 358. And this is kind of the calming after the storm. This will take you through the understanding of the basement tapes. Um, it gives you a breakdown of that fund. And something that I thought was really interesting because of course going through all of this i thought i knew everything but there was actually transcripts or depositions that were vaulted away from the general public not to be released until 2027 that's 28 years after the tragedy and the reason that they were vaulted because the judge did not want to cause a social unjust or upheaval but why the arbitrary time frame of 28 years still baffles me but in 2027 which is eight short years from now we will possibly get some more information and of course i'm sure another book will come out discussing whatever those transcripts hold so of course as i'm compiling all of this data for my book review i was doing some video searching through the youtube platform and i did discover a video segment that was released september 29th 2015 it is the closest in correlation with the release of this book and i will link it down below i highly encourage you to watch it because it does give you a visual of not only our author dave cullen but you also get a visual of frank DeAngelis and two students that were there and part of the tragedy that day. So that is the retro report presented by the New York Times. And I, again, I will link that down below. It's 12 minutes and 20 seconds in length and very well worth your time. In that video, there is a short clip of Anderson Cooper, who I believe is on CNN now. And he says, in history, it seems that people remember the names of the murderers and not the victims. So I leave you on this note. Let the names Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold lie in the grave. Instead, remember Rachel Scott, Corey DePooter, Kyle Velasquez, Isaiah Scholes, Kelly Fleming, Daniel Mouser, Cassie Bernal, Stephen Kernow, Daniel Rohrbau, Lauren Townsend, John Tomlin, Matthew Ketchler, and Dave Sanders. In chapter 17, the Klebold's lawyer said, Dylan isn't here for anyone to hate anymore. So they're gonna hate you. I think that going in I didn't have hate in my heart, but I had a lot of unanswered questions. And I think the biggest question 
that lies on the minds of people still today is the why. When you are extremely vested in something, you really want that question to be answered. You want to understand, you want to be able to humanize tragedy. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes bad people are born into this world and they're gonna do really bad things. And there's nothing any of us can do to stop that. And that's the reality of the situation. So don't hate the Harrises. Don't hate the Klebolds because hate is a quality that's gonna affect you and not them. They don't know why either. Nothing made sense. Nothing panned out as to why this tragedy should have happened. Inevitably, they both lost their sons in this. It's senseless. It's all senseless. But if you want to continue on with the conversation, please join myself and Joni over on Joni's channel, which is Joni Reads. I will leave that in the description box below. And we are going to discuss this book in further detail and kind of just, of course, as before, bounce ideas off of each other and continue on with the conversation. Overall, I toggled with star ratings for this book. I desperately want to give this book five stars because it did so much for me as someone who is truly vested in this tragedy. However, thinking back to how this all started, consciously, morally, I know that I am choosing to be a consumer of someone else's tragedy. So it is extremely difficult on that premise to rate anything to deal with tragedy higher than four stars. So Dave Cullen, the writing I, I will tell you is perfection, but overall I'm going to give this book four stars because I cannot in good conscience in good faith say that a book was that good that I loved it when I know when I know its outcome. So for those of you who are unable to carry on the conversation with Joni and I tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Eastern time on her channel and do want to carry on with the crime scene read through, our selection for the month of May will be The Girls Are Gone. This book was written by Michael Broadcorb and Allison Mann. This is a true story of two sisters who vanished, the father who kept searching, and the adults who conspired to keep the truth hidden. This story takes place in Minnesota. I read through it a little bit. I understand that it is, of course, two sisters who went missing. Somehow their mom is involved in keeping the truth hidden. The father, of course, digs into it a little bit deeper, but there's much more to the story, which I have no idea what that's all about. Joni and I both received respective free copies of this book to review in exchange for our honest opinion. So we have decided since we both received copies to go ahead and provide that collectively for our crime scene segment. So this again will be our May selection. We do hope that you can join us tomorrow night on Joni's channel, 6 p.m. Eastern time. If I leave you here, thank you so much for watching. Until next time, take care.